Bird of the Year, Elden Ring. To nobody's surprise, I'm an Elden Ring enjoyer. There are a lot of obvious reasons, and a lot of reasons that would take a very long time to actually discuss, so instead, I'm just going to talk about this diabolical enemy introduced in the game's first major, yet somehow also optional dungeon. This thing? A genuine menace. It's going to go down as one of FromSoft's most fiendish enemies. Specifically, it's going to go down to hell, with the bone wheel skeletons and every iteration of the dogs over the years, along with the Anorlando archers. If you were building an all-star roster of bastard enemies, no doubt the Elden Ring knife birds are on the starting lineup. I love these things. Iconic, unforgettable. Main menu theme of the year, Signalis. It starts with three shrill tones followed by a mechanical voice, a woman calling for attention in German before reciting a string of numbers. This eerie tableau is an old number station broadcast known as the Three Note Oddity, and it serves as the centerpiece for Signalis' main menu theme. An unsettling track like this anchored around a number station broadcast is the perfect mood setter for this game, a classic survival horror game with a sci-fi twist. It gives you a feel for the dread that suffuses the game, it parallels espionage being a major plot point, and it mirrors the labyrinthian, almost puzzle-like nature of Signalis' story. It's disconcerting, but you can't help but be curious about it, because it's an inviting mystery, much like the game itself. Most Metal Game of the Year, Metal Hellsinger. Not only does Metal Hellsinger nail the metal aesthetic, it gains a lot of credibility by featuring an ensemble cast of metal musicians, including Alyssa White Gluz from Arch Enemy and Randy Blythe from Lamb of God, throughout its soundtrack. To me though, what makes Hellsinger feel so authentically metal is that I have a hard time sitting still playing it. It makes me want to headbang. Metal as a genre animates me. I have to get up and do something. I have to burn through this white hot ball of energy it creates in my chest. And that's why this is the most metal game of 2022. Headbanging is kind of a feature. Okay, aggressive head bobbing, unless you're really getting into it. But still, the action inspired heavily by Doom is all kinetic fury and chaos married to the mechanics of a high-tempo rhythm game. And it is mesmerizing in its ability to just work. And it's so exhilarating. Keeping the rhythm physically by moving your body, by tapping your toes, by, by nodding your head, by headbanging or something, makes concentrating on shooting, dashing, and reloading to the beat easier. And it just feels natural to do while you play. Especially when you hit a 16x combo streak and the lyrics start kicking in, and then you might actually start headbanging. It just feels outstanding. Most bang for your buck of the year, Vampire Survivors. Caveat, I do not think you could just boil down the value of art by dividing how many hours you engaged with a thing by how much you paid for it. There are a lot of games that would be improved by trimming a few sections and a lot of games that are worse off for being way too padded out. But also, I recognize that we live in an economy, so I am sympathetic to people who might be looking at that bang for your buck angle and who might be reticent about dropping up to $70 for something that'll just come and go. To that end, Vampire Survivors costs $5 US if you don't get it on sale, and I have so far gotten 50 hours of enjoyment out of it. It's the type of game that excels at tickling your brain chemistry, with a bombardment of lights and sounds as you become the strobing core of a miniature sun that rips apart anything that comes on screen atom by atom. Player agency mostly comes in the form of creating builds, secret hunting, and very fine, precise movements. There is a vast ocean of secret characters, weapons, variant stages, and bosses to unlock, and moment to moment, especially early in a run, you're doing a lot of dodging, a lot of juking, and a lot of carefully corralling enemies. At least, until you metamorphosize into such a singularly powerful being that not even the manifested concept of death can lay its icy fingers upon you. Then you will become the axis upon which this reshaped world turns. Then you can just stand perfectly still and the dopamine will come directly to you. 
Best Little Dudes of the Year, Tinykin. This is Milo. As you can see, he's just a little guy. And it's his birthday. And he's wearing glasses. But we don't care about Milo. This game is named after the mobs of little guys Milo finds called Tinykin. They complete circuits, they act as ladders, they haul things, they'll even die for you. My favorite part is that every time you find a new type, they get introduced in a cartoon interlude that's just bouncy and adorable. Similar to other classic little guy sims like Unraveled, It Takes Two, Pikmin, Ratatouille, and arguably Little Nightmares, you're in a mundane setting made fantastical by the radical shift in perspective that accompanies being bug size. Speaking of bugs, honorary little guy mentions to all the cute bugs who make up the cast of side characters like Gasper or Little Degater, who I'm pretty sure is named after the guy who composed the Internationale. Tinykin is replete with cool sights and sounds and adorable little dudes. It's a charming good time to play. Game which does the most with the least of the year. Iron Lung. You are an untrained convict, welded inside of a makeshift submarine known as the Iron Lung, and sent to explore the blood ocean of a faraway moon on the desperate hope that something, anything, of value to the remnants of humanity can be scavenged. The hull was not designed to descend this far, any glancing contact with something solid and it will rupture. Your oxygen depletes every meter you crawl forward, completely blind, save for the tittering alert of a motion sensor warning you of impending collisions. There's also a single front-mounted camera that can snap just a single grainy photo at a time. And you are alone. Interred in a steel sarcophagus under the fathomless depths where no light and no warmth can reach. The vast, merciless ocean wrapped around this doomed vessel and squeezing like a boa constrictor. The groan of the hull rumbles through the interior. Iron Lung is terrifying. It is a game in a bottle and I've never seen something so horrifyingly effective come from so little. Speedrunning Game of the Year, Neon White. Neon White does the most effective job at making me want to speedrun its levels out of perhaps any game that I've ever played. Its levels are bite-sized, which is a deliberate choice that makes the idea of replaying the level just for the hell of it a bit more appealing. It's not a big time sink to dip your toes in the water. It won't feel overwhelming. And then at the end of the level, you get a medal to rank your completion time. Silver, gold, and the most prestigious medal, asexual. Each rank of metal you earn unlocks something about the level to goad you towards trying to do it again faster. Unless you're ace, in which case you get a little gift, Happy Pride Month, which is when this video was supposed to go up. So you finish this breezy 30 to 60 second long level and unlock the ability to race your ghost. You can even see how many seconds you need to raise your rank. Restarting a level is instant, which again makes it very tempting. It doesn't require much commitment to try to speedrun a level. And most importantly, playing it feels good. Also, it really helped having the friends tab of the leaderboard so I could finish a level, see my friend finished it 10 entire seconds faster, and then have that motivating me to go back and improve my own time to compete with him. All in all, Neon White's focus is on getting you to love the thrill of speedrunning, to find satisfaction in the pursuit of excellence one millisecond at a time, and he does a wonderful job. 16th Century Bavarian History Lesson of the Year Pentiment Andreas Mahler is a traveling artist who takes a job in a Benedictine abbey outside of the alpine town of Tassing. He lodges with a local family and becomes deeply entwined in the lives of the townsfolk. Pentiment follows 25 years of his life in the town, along with all of the intrigue he gets wrapped up in, like someone trying to perform occult rituals, a church embezzlement scheme, and a murder mystery. Over those 25 years, you also spend a lot of time with the other townsfolk. You talk with them, you party with them, you eat with them. You eat with them a lot. So much. And you spend your work days among the sisters and the monks and the other scribes and artists who are your professional peers and mentors. You see how tensions develop between the townsfolk and the abbey when the miserly abbot starts raising their taxes and preventing them from foraging in the woods outside of town. 
a game that touches on the theft of the commons and the peasant rebellions. How cool is that? It's also full of glossary entries that you can access from clicking on a highlighted word mid-conversation, which is really handy if you don't already know that the Fuggers were a prominent, extremely wealthy banking family in Augsburg who had a monopoly on the European copper market, or that a calefactory is a communal warming room in monasteries. Pentiment in myriad ways is a game about history and the philosophy of history, authored by people who clearly love the study and want to share that love and it's resulted in one of the most interesting and richest games of the year. Gig Economy Simulator of the Year Citizen Sleeper Here's the rundown of Citizen Sleeper. The gig economy is terrible, mushrooms are delicious, and in the 1920s a bunch of lightbulb companies formed a cartel which conspired to cut the average lifespan of the products in half in what is widely considered the first act of corporate plant obsolescence. That's not game lore, that really happened. And it became common practice, and in the future Citizen Sleeper imagines, that practice has gotten a lot worse. You play as an escaped sleeper, a digitized copy of another person's mind inserted into an entirely synthetic human body, who is afforded very few rights. They are essentially corporate property, and their bodies are built to deteriorate quickly without a proprietary stabilizing agent, something which usually ties them to the company that made their bodies in the first place. After escaping, you wind up on a space station called the Eye. You're by yourself, you have no money, you have no possessions, no shelter, no source for the medicine that you need. Nothing. But someone finds you and gives you a place to sleep. It's the very first thing that happens in the game, and it's an act of receiving help from someone. Someone else who isn't in a particularly great situation themselves. Each day in Citizen Sleeper, you roll a number of dice, and the better shape that your body is in, the more well-rested and fed you are, the more dice you get. You need dice to do jobs and to explore your interests around the station. Your body, again, is designed to break down, and when you do find a source for stabilizer, it's expensive, which means you need enough dice to take enough jobs on to afford things. It can run you ragged. It's unstable. It can be overwhelming. But you tend to weather that by receiving help from others and helping them in return. You build resilience through a support network of really interesting characters, like the stoic chef who just wants to cook rare mushrooms for you, his bud, and the sentient vending machine, or the lady who runs the commune. On one of the gigs you can take around the station, you'll meet one of many people in precarious spots similar to your own. His name is Lem. He's a single father to his little girl, Mina. Lem is struggling to balance raising her with taking enough shifts to provide for her, including the cost of childcare while he's out at work. Once you get to know him and actually meet Mina, he asks you a huge favor that involves putting a lot of trust in you. He asks if you can babysit Mina sometimes so he can pull extra shifts so that he can work towards something important for them. Their story arc is really beautiful. It's the part of the game that I'm still thinking about long after finishing it. It felt great to make a friend in a strange place, to have their trust and to help them when they needed it. Just like how someone helped me way back when I needed it when I started the game.